This is Zeno Robinson, the voice of Cyborg, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Hello team, welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode 15 of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host Emily. Hey everybody, in these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, character arcs, themes, comic book history, and everything else about Young Justice and then use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Miss Martian was needed at the MetaHuman Youth Center, so she assigned me to lead Gamma Squad. This will be a covert mission. Recon only. Psh, they always say recon only. It never turns out that way. The mission had better turn out that way. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Leverage. The release date was July 2nd, 2019. The in-episode date was uh, November 16th and 17th. The writer was Tom Pugsley. The director was Vinton Huke. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. In addition to the regular cast and their familiar characters, we also have Troy Baker... This episode as the director, J. Anson Schwartz, Britt Barron as Leslie Willis, Livewire, Steve Bloom as Henchy, Dimitri Pushkin, i.e. Rocket Red number four, Zara Fuzzle as Wendy Jones, Windfall, Crispin Freeman as Captain Boomerang, Bruce Greenwood as Edward Dorado Sr., Stephanie Lemlin as Olga Ilyich, uh, i.e. Rocket, Rocket Red number one, Cheryl Lee Ralph as Amanda Waller, Freddie Rodriguez as Ed Dorado Jr. And Carrie Payton back as Black Manta. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 15 starts with a look at how Granny Goodness is making Garfield's life on the set of Space Trek 3016 extremely difficult. We then cut it over to a quick look at what a normal day in the life of the Harper Wen Croc household is like before Garfield heads to the Watchtower, where he's assigned to a stealth mission uh, team investigating a government-sponsored meta program in Russia, which is, of course, outside of the League's jurisdiction under all of those UN charters. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is why we have a stealth team. It's fine. This is fine. <laughs> The team is unsure whether or not the facility, Ploshed 52, is a meta-weapon facility or the equivalent of the youth center in Taos, so they're going to investigate. Meanwhile, over in Taos, Dr. Eduardo Dorado Sr. and his son Ed, who we saw last in Season 2 as a member of The Runaways, are leading orientation at the new MetaHuman Youth Center, introducing a number of young metateens to the support systems the facility has in place. Scientists, counselors, peer advisors, and even the option to voluntarily place an inhibitor collar on themselves. Later on, we see the team arriving in Russia and discovering mech-armored volunteers working to become a team of government-sponsored heroes, the Russian government's answer to a world full of metas. However, as the team attempts to leave after gathering recon, they encounter Captain Boomerang, Black Manta, and Monsu Mala, who should all be in Bel Rev. Uh, they are launching an assault on the Ploshed 52 base. Artemis decides to break cover to defend the Russian facility. The villains attempt to retreat, but we discover that they're working with, for, under, somehow, Amanda Waller, former warden of Bell Rev, and a quick threat of pain, death, not exactly sure uh, in the Young Justice interpretation, from Waller sends them back into the fray against both the team and the Russians' Rocket Red Brigade. During the fight, Halo has a flashback to the night Brion and Tara's parents were murdered, which puts her in harm's way. Again, while the brigade successfully beats both the heroes and the villains, Artemis is then forced to talk her way out of an international incident, made more complicated by the fact that the most recently created Red recognizes Garfield from TV. 
The team heads back to the U.S. to deliver all three villains back to Bel Rev, where Aquaman officially learns from Waller that villains are being used as a quote-unquote suicide squad, a.k.a. Task Force X. And if he wants to out Waller and her program, she will retaliate in kind by outing the League's covert team. Over in Taos, Ed's trying his best to train and counsel several metateens, including Mist and Livewire, who we saw in some previous episodes as villains. But a new meta, Wendy Jones, loses control of her powers and nearly suffocates Ed, Livewire, and Mist. That's what happens when you can create tornadoes and don't know how to control them. That's right. Uh, Suck the air out of a room. (laughs) (laughs) Ed manages to teleport her outside the facility, which stops that problem. But the incident terrifies her uh, so much that we see her in the final scenes deciding to put on an inhibitor collar even after she said earlier that she would never want to do that. Poor Ed, too. Poor Ed. He's trying his he best. feels like he failed. Yeah. He's really, really trying here. In the rest of the final scenes, we see Hardware introducing Dr. Helga Jace to her own lab in Dakota City and her experimenting on the hair from the hairbrush we saw in the first half of season one. Nothing ominous there. It's totally fine. And we wrap the episode with a more detailed look at Halo's flashback from earlier with the revelation that Gabrielle Dow, the former quote-unquote owner of Halo's current body, accepted a bribe to let in the assassins that murdered Brion's parents. And she's not telling anyone. (laughs) They must never know. Never. Yes. Never. (laughs) Aster time. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. So, Aster, what do we want to start with? Where are we going to begin with this? This first point you made on the notes, I just didn't even notice. Yeah, I I should have known better. So on my 10 millionth watch through of this episode last night, I uh, just added the note to our outline that simply says, let me guess, the Space Trek director is somebody from DC history and just left that there for Rich to answer at his at his leisure. And Rich found an answer. I well, I, I saw that and I was like I was like, oh wait, he does have lines, doesn't he? Yeah. So uh I went back and I had the to do some research lines, online. There's someone. <laughs> right. Lines in a name. It's gotta be someone. Uh I went back, did some research online. Uh the YJ Wiki. And uh, I think Comic Vine, some other websites. Anyway, they're they're speculating, which I think is is sounds right to me. Is that uh, J. Anson Schwartz? I don't know where the Anson comes from. But, uh, I couldn't find that, but probably refers to Julius Schwartz, aka Julie Schwartz. Uh, Julie Schwartz was a longtime editor of DC for decades. So when we talk about in the previous uh, episodes, we've talked about this sci-fi like tweak and revival of superheroes. So the Jay Garrick flash from world war one, world war two uh, gets rebooted as the Barry Allen flash uh, has this more science fiction, sciency origin. Um, and then we also get like the Alan Scott green lantern becomes the Hal Jordan green lantern. And we get the green lantern core and all of that, all of that stuff was Julie Schwartz uh, artists, uh, Carmine Infantino and Joe Kubert. And uh, Robert Kaniger, who was one of the was one of the writers at the time, who uh, and an editor uh, eventually as well, who created Sergeant Rock and Easy Company. And when I talk about how I learned how to read on the Legion, um, my brother used to bring these comics home. He always had like the same four or five titles that he brought home: Mike Grell's The Warlord, uh, the Conan comics that Marvel, I believe, was putting out at the time. Superboy and Legion of Superheroes and, uh, you know, the war comics that were really big in the like late 60s, early 70s. So Sergeant Rock and Easy Company, uh, Weird War Tales, uh, the, God, what do they call them? Creature Commandos and the Haunted Tank and like DC and Marvel both, but largely DC was putting out a ton of these. And uh, Robert Kaniger is the one who created Sergeant Rock. So that was really cool. So yeah, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't catch that at all. So there you go. I didn't go. know who it was. This is why we're a team. You just know, but you know, it's got to be the law of conservation of DC characters. It's got to be someone. Speaking of characters having names, the the worst segue I've ever had. That's uh, a good one. Yeah, yeah, we're reaching uh, for that one. 
<laughs> I just I just need to point out that Leon calls Artemis Auntie Mouse, and it continues yeah. to be the cutest thing I have ever seen, and right. I'll never be We're... over it, and it oh. deserves all the shout outs, and I love it. Also voiced by Zero Fuzzle, and yes. I, I don't know if this happened, but I just picture uh, Crispin Freeman and Zara uh, in the same room with like actual food in their mouth, like looking at each other doing this scene together, and it is it cracks me up in my head canon. So like like that's that's almost definitely how this actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> as someone as someone who knows a, a little bit about voice acting, uh, and has <laughs> done research and whatnot, most of the time when characters are having to eat in a scene and ha- that has they have to have some noise for that. A lot of the time, it's just actors nice. actually eating in the studio because there's no way to really fake that in a way that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> And Will, of course, being awesome dad. And, yep, amazing. Amazing scene. He's a good, good dad. (laughs) He's a good dad. He's a solid dad, for sure. Uh, And we'll get to other stuff from that later. (laughs) Crashing the mode. Crashing the mode. (laughs) Um, But I do, I also really love in this episode when Beast Boy finally shows up on the Watchtower after 52 takes. Which is right. so many. So uh, many takes. And just immediately, one is very comfortable in that setting. I kind of noticed this time through, like, because he's just coming back. Like, everyone else in that room, all of the other, like, new members of the team are kind of very little, little unsure, it seems. They're all being very serious, very, very professional teen heroes here. And Beast Boy just kind of comes in, huffs into the scene, and then just keeps making jokes about stuff. Because I'm like, oh, right. you're just... You're just coming back. You, you're used <laughs> right. to this. You're like, this is how things are. Why are you all so uptight? He basically just grew up with this. Like, this yeah. is he's, it's old home week for him. This is like, normal. It makes sense. Uh, yeah. But I also do love uh, several things about Beast Boys. They always say recon only. It never turns out that way line, both because it is Beast Boy just coming back to this life and being like no no it's not it's we're never this it doesn't work like that guys it never happens calder having to be like stop please let me be a professional for five seconds beast boy don't call (laughs) us out like this uh and then thing i only noticed this time through uh with everything is that i love that tara's the only one who like reacts to it and pays attention Mm -hmm. when Beast Boy starts saying that. Like, Forager kind of, like, smiles and nods because Beast Boy is talking directly to Forager. But Tara, who is not part of this conversation, just in the background, just kind of turns, looks, absorbs this information, and nods, and then goes back to paying attention to Calder. He's like, okay, file that away. That's a good thing to know. And I'm like, hmm, Tara's good. I like... Tara, Tara's got a whole storyline ahead of her, but I like going back going and noticing these moments where Tara is just like, this is something I should pay attention to. Yeah. Uh, I, I was laughing because Neil puts a, put a note uh, later on. I happened to notice that he says, hey, they almost had a successful stealth mission. Almost. Like they finished their, they finished their mission and they were leaving. Yes. When something else ended up happening. So they, it's like 80% credit. For a yeah. stealth mission, it led to an international incident. But other than that, yeah, they did quite a good job. Before the international incident, a very successful stealth mission. I mean, super <laughs> right. quiet, completely <laughs> unseen, great. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then, they, then Actually, we reached I, I really liked the uh, the use of everybody's powers. Yeah. The uh, the animation implying Geoforce like melted away like thousands of tons of rock to go that far deep and back up again is quite the implication of the extent of his abilities. But like the whole, the whole idea, Halo doing her, the whole illusion thing was really, really cool. It was right. I, and (laughs) the glowing contact lenses, not great for stealth looked awesome. (laughs) The only only a little bit, only a little, (laughs) I guess they looked, there's a scene where they're coming out and everybody's eyes are glowing. That was rad. Like it looks yeah. really, really cool. But I was just like, "You've got Arctic stealth and super bright, glowy eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it looks amazing. Probably not the best." I really, I really liked uh, glowing contacts on a green bird. 
uh, Beast oh, Boy right. just having them. I, I, that amused me. I'm not even sure why. Just I like the idea of him being like, time to activate my super high-tech contact lenses yeah. while I'm not even human. <laughs> right. It's it's interesting. Oh, I just, I just kind of realized this too, because he's got that collar that he wears. Yep. Because he can't, he doesn't have the, the functionality to speak yeah. when he's in these different animal forms for the most part. But so he's got that collar that he wears. And I was just like, have we seen anything like that? And, and then I was just like, whoa, wait a minute. Yes, we absolutely saw that technology in the, <laughs> the tie-in comics first with the gorillas from Gorilla City, right? Didn't they have this thing? And were they, were they talk out of it? Was that in the tie-in comics? I can't remember if they talked or if Miss Martian was able to Ms. Martian only was telepathically linking them communicate telepathically. with them. Because she does that, and I'm not sure if that's the only way they all communicated. I do have a note to say about Beast Boy's collar, because I know fun facts. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, fun facts. Because <laughs> Beast Boy's collar, I believe Greg Weissman confirmed this on Ask Greg when it came up in season two, when the Beast Boy first showed up, is that Beast Boy's collar is is Martian clothing tech that McGann got for him that only has two settings, his normal suit and the collar, but he just manipulates it with his mind. It's Martian tech. It's like it's like McGann's suit. Oh, is the explanation for it. That's so cool. Where did you hear that? Ask Greg. Per- I think that was an Ask Greg thing. It's one of those it's one of those random facts that I've I just been know, floating around. And I've yeah, known yeah. for just a long time that I can't remember where I saw it the first time anymore. But it sounds like something that I think was on Ask Greg. And if someone wants to fact check me or find find the post, please do. Uh, but I've always had that in my mind is like, oh, yeah, that's the explanation. And I think it's because of Ask Greg. Hmm. Interesting. That's cool, though. I yeah. like that idea. Because you got it because you got to figure out a way for Beast Boy to have clothes. <laughs> so he doesn't tear out of his Batman shirt and then not be able to yes. change back from gorilla form. <laughs> we don't want the Los Angeles gorilla incident every time. <laughs> Right, exactly. I liked having the, uh, I don't know, I'm kind of imp- I'm impressed by uh, Bruce Greenwood's uh, Ed Dorado Sr. And I love the fact that they call back to this thing with the Taos Center and we get to see that. Yes. I know they were focusing on just a, you know, a, a handful of characters, but uh, there's a lot of teens in the world that are being turned into stuff 16,000 that they knew of missing at the beginning around the world of course but like that room's gonna get full <laughs> pretty soon and it's great to see Ed back and like someone saying just like with Garfield like hey I have powers but I'm not a you don't have to do this other job yeah like I just happen to have this ability that I'm doing a thing you know and I love I love how they find ways to connect everything like the Taos U Center isn't an isolated part of this universe. Cause like by just bringing in McGann and Dinah, you have that just that little bit of connection into that, that also just fleshes them out as characters. I love the implication that they're just, they're therapists to superheroes. That's right. just one of the things they do. And I'm like, I love that. That's a thing in the young justice universe. Yeah. That both absolutely. of them are just like, no, we, we get it. We're here to help. <laughs> Yeah, and when they talk about this uh, Plowshed 52 base being a potentially just like the Taos yeah. New Mexico Center, it, it implies this idea that there are other places like this around the world, which there should be in different countries doing different things. And so, yeah, I'm interested. And also, did they mention where they got that intel from? I don't remember. I don't. I don't remember either. I don't think so. I was just watching that scene before we started. I don't think Calder says where they got this info but that's a very good question (laughs) which is interesting to me because they must have gotten that intel relatively recently yeah but waller is also sending a task force x team at the same time i mean it feels un it doesn't feel coincidental and maybe not that it was done on purpose but that however waller found out about it maybe parallel to however the league found out about it yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't I know what implications that. that might have, but I was curious. I couldn't remember if Calder had said, like, we got this from so and so, you know. A name is not coming to mind, but I feel like it yeah, maybe I don't think so either. Maybe it gets tied into some stuff later this season during one of our 
like backtracking exposition things, maybe, but I'm maybe. not sure. I'm not sure either. Or there is always the possibility that it's Barbara. Like when in doubt, just chalk up new info to, yeah. to Barbara surfing the internet. But right. <laughs> surfing, is that the way to describe hers? <laughs> it's like scuba diving the internet. Yes. Diving. Yeah. Diving the internet. Yeah, for sure. And that could very well be just basically the same source that meant that Waller got her information yeah. from may have just been, you know, hacked into or seen by Oracle. Yeah, that's an interesting. I like that story. That's my head cannon now. There you go. But with with that whole mission, I do think it's interesting that they have Artemis kind of she makes a good point when Brion is like, it's time to fight and defeat these mech people. And Artemis is like, no, no that's not our job. This is they're just doing what we do that we can't yeah. just fight that at every turn. That's we don't get to do that. And Brion is just being hot headed Brion about everything. But I like that Artemis kind of has that moment. Where she's like, no, no, settle, settle down. No, no. <laughs> yeah. We can't punch everything. It is interesting the fact that they fold in this Markovia's relationship with Russia and a historical issue there that's happening, you know? Because we look at, like, say, Bialya, and I don't think that she would have the same problem <laughs> with yeah. going in and stopping Bialya from doing something. So. That's in, it's interesting to me. Yeah. Black Manta holds a grudge. <laughs> he really does. <laughs> uh, uh, just the idea, just Black Manta still harping on this two years later. I think on some level he's just annoyed that Artemis and his son didn't end up dating. <laughs> apparently. I didn't think about that. I don't he know, shipped I'm that. He shipped I'm that pretty hard. Joking. He did. He did. Yeah. It's like, look at my supervillain son and his definitely superhero girlfriend, supervillain girlfriend and Caldas. Right. Like, Murder no. girlfriend. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. God. I do. I do like all those. I love, I genuinely love on Young Justice every time our heroes are way too casual and familiar with villains. <laughs> Right. Like everyone treats Black Manta like you're like, uh, oh, it's Calder's dad again. Like no one treats Black Manta like the genuine threat he absolutely is. Everyone's just like, stop holding your grudge against me for that one time that I impersonated a supervillain and infiltrated your entire organization. Like, come on. Like he has a laser cannon for a head. You should be more worried. <laughs> Yeah, but and also, is this imply that he's been in Bell Rev for two years? Like, maybe I find it interesting. I, I I like it. I like this idea that yes, we've had multiple like situations where characters have left Bell Rev, but they're actually pretty far between, and because of the time jumps, it doesn't feel like the revolving door of Arkham and you know Batman comics. Yeah, so like. They should have been in Bell Rev. Okay. Actually, they probably were for the last two years, you know, and they keep going back. So nobody really knows that they're gone, which kind of makes sense. There was the incident with uh, Ivo and the robot, but he ended up going back too. So like there's a couple of things, but it it, it still feels like Bell Rev is a secure facility, yeah. right? Even the breakout, right? And terrors. Which I kind of like, and it's another kind of quote like advantage, quote unquote, of these time jumps, that yeah. we can have these spot moments of people escaping or doing something, but it feels like it's a unique situation. Because even even the Professor Ivo thing, if I'm remembering correctly, he doesn't break out; he gets let out because Hugo Strange is involved right. at that point. So no one has successfully broken out of Bell Rev in the course of this sh series, as far as we've seen. Nigma. <laughs> <laughs> Nigma's right. it. Nigma's right. it. That's the They're one. the only. He's the only one. He just. He just wants to. <laughs> he just wants to go do puzzles. That's all he wants. Like somehow, Nigma was the only one who got out during this thing. That cracks me up. <laughs> so I funny. Forgot about that. It's my know, favorite right? episode, and I completely forgot that that was part of that episode. <laughs> oh, Nigma. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I love that Neil had been referring to this team as the leftovers. Uh, before we found out that it was Task Force, Task Force X. Because 
Boomerang is often Task Force X. Yes. Mala and Black Manta, I don't know if they've ever been in the Suicide Squad. I'm, there's been so many villains in and out of it. I'm sure it probably happened at some point. I think it's because a lot of a lot of the people who are part of the Suicide Squad traditionally haven't been introduced on Young Justice yet, if I'm remembering correctly. Deadshot? No. The scenes yeah. I'm thinking. No. Seems no I'm Deadshot thinking was in Deadshot. the comics. We haven't seen Deadshot. In oh, the show. that's it. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, Deadshot was in the comics. Harley, Which, who we haven't seen. Nope. Though now I just want Young Justice Harley. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who else is usually in there? Croc is often in there. Have we seen Croc? Who we haven't seen? I don't think nope. so. Nope, I don't think we've seen Croc either. Yeah, Rick Flag hasn't been introduced. Though they did mention him. Rick Flag does exist. They Black Manta oh, yeah. mentions send in Flag to get us out. Oh, that's right. That's we right. That's true. Him. So he's that's here. True. We just don't see. He's him. here. I gotcha. Yeah, so it was easy to look at that group going like, that's a random group of people, you know, together. Uh, or the rest of the Conservation of DC gallery. characters. <laughs> right, exactly. And it makes sense for this this group. Why would we introduce four new villains when we have these right. <laughs> these perfectly good ones sitting in storage? <laughs> right. <laughs> Bell Rev storage. Yeah. So I do, I do really love this whole scene. I do really love this whole fight. It's a good fight. It's a well put together fight. I don't... I don't like Captain Boomerang. I don't like him. He's very gross. I don't like He's him. Gross. I don't. And yeah. and this was at the point in the series, the first time through, where we were like, "Gosh, I wish Halo could go a couple more episodes without getting without- brutally stabbed." Uh, <laughs> right. But I think this is one of the last yeah. few for a for a while, if I'm remembering correctly, which is good. But it was still I one of those so. things where I was like, "No, no, can we? Can we not?" Can we yeah. not? We get it. She she can't die. We get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, Captain Boomerang is is perfectly calculated to make me hate him automatically. <laughs> yeah, he's garbagey. <laughs> for he's, sure, he's, he's pretty bad. But other than that, I do I do very much like that scene in general. I do like the whole way that fight plays out and everything. And I also love the implication that Black Manta has just never mentioned the team until it was like vaguely useful he's known about this for how many years and has just never mentioned it to anybody who didn't already know seemingly it seems like waller too like i yeah i i I think i mentioned this in the scream something but this idea that waller doesn't know any doesn't know something is so alien to me (laughs) because she's in the comics and justice league unlimited like she knew everything like batman's secret identity like in justice league unlimited which is a great scene by the way when bruce and waller are face to face both on the street for the first time where she calls him rich boy or something and then he shows up at her house (laughs) those are both amazing scenes but it's so interesting to me that she didn't know that the team existed, which tells me a couple things. One, she's new at this job, right? Which is kind of implied, right? We saw her as warden, and now she's worked her way up through federal government things, and now she's doing what she's doing. because Probably because she's an expert on these villains, right? Because she was the warden, so they brought her in to do this Task Force, task, task force X thing, which I think makes perfect sense. But also, she's not the intelligence, like a CIA, NSA intelligence person that she was in the comics. She's brought into this job because of her expertise or knowledge or understanding of the villains that are being used in this team. So she doesn't yet have all of the information that she will have, which I actually think is great. I I still love Mala turning and going, oh, (laughs) Like when they're like they have a they have a covert ops team and Mala's like, I have been trying to tell someone, you know, or like yes, they have, I have faced them many times, <laughs> which I think is so funny to me. To listen to him, he's been trying so hard. It almost feels like this is the instigating factor for Waller to become the Waller that she will become. Yeah, like oh, I could totally see that. Yeah, hold up, we what? <laughs> like, we don't know everything that's going on. Like, yes, the UN has a satellite park next to the watchtower and, and all this stuff. But I, I can see her now being motivated and pushed to becoming that intelligence gathering central core person that, that Waller 
is in the comics, which I think is really, really cool. I know we've been talking about the Taos Youth Center, and we mentioned it, I think, in our Scream something. I do really like Livewire in this. I think she's cool. Yeah. I like her. I like that she has a personality. I like that she's not just inherently evil. She's just kind of doing her own thing. And my note here just says, I just want Livewire to reform and be the delinquent playbook for masks and help people alongside her girlfriend, Mist. <laughs> That's what I want. Because uh, I do, I like that she has a relationship with Mist. I know they're very background, but I kind of I kind of ship it. I think they're cute. I think I like Livewire, who's just like, I'm, I'm here, I'm confident, no one can tell me what to do. And then the second Mist gets hurt, she's like, I will burn everything to the ground <laughs> to protect this girl. I will will end you <laughs> yes yeah she protect but she also attack yeah and because mist is so she's kind yes she was doing terrible things but because she had been controlled yeah and you could like the whole time she's apologizing to great to dick Grayson, yeah. like the whole time that she's attacking him and i see like i i see mist being this grounding for well that was a terrible pun grounding force for live wire in being just that she's so I wouldn't say innocent, but like she's like she's got a good heart, and Livewire want is drawn to that in some way. I like that a lot. I'd, yeah, all of the above. I like it. I think it's cool. I also just like Livewire's design and her civilian clothes. I think it looks cool. She's got yeah. like skeleton leggings, and it's <laughs> yeah. cool. She's yeah. it's cool. I like it. Give me <laughs> give me more Livewire. Let the Taos Youth Center help her. Let her be a cool hero in season seven. <laughs> <laughs> Planning ahead, but. Final couple of things, little things that I like. I think it's hilarious that Garfield doesn't get recognized for being Garfield. He gets recognized for being Tork in yeah. Russia. Yeah. So it's like, aren't, aren't you, aren't you Tork? That's like meeting. <laughs> it's like meeting like Chris Evans while on he's on a secret mission as Chris Evans and just going Captain America. Like it's just hilarious to me. Right. <laughs> And Gar's just so tired. He's like, no, 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 I'm not. It's like, this is not really? working for me. And yeah. And, you know, all of these things building up with him, like, how can I do this? How can I get back to the life in a way that makes sense for me? Yeah. And and finally, I, I love Calder just at it again with the dad sass. <laughs> he sees his dad for two seconds, exchanges like three lines, and all of right. them are just him being It's a good thing there's no heck. windows in your cell, dad. <laughs> like, it's the, the best possible response his dad's trying to be like i can't believe you're aquaman he's like you don't have to see me be aquaman yeah <laughs> go back to prison because you're in jail <laughs> right uh his dad like troll like trying to troll him or something and he was just they're just both it. sassing each other it. back and forth and i <laughs> and i love it uh the genetic predisposition to sass yes Absolutely. So, what do you have for Astro Bitch? Uh, what do you have? I have to a add? few things. I I mentioned, of course, the the fifty two takes, uh, and of course the Plusha so fifty two base. Yeah, a lot of fifty twos. Uh, but then, as I put in my notes, the fifty two takes and the Plusha fifty two base. Neil's like, "Oh, there's so much more than that." I was like, "Oh no, what did he do?" <laughs> so we're gonna get to Neil's notes in a few minutes because there's some strangeness going on that I didn't notice that Neil did. The Rocket Red projects at this Plushed 52 base and i was like okay is Plushed like a is that a city in russia i don't know what that is and so i was trying to i looked it up looked up a, a bunch of spellings of Plushed, like trying to take the russian language and put it in you know in, in an english translation can be put in a bunch of different ways turns out Blo Plushed is <laughs> and i should have just seen this because this it means area so it's area 52 which is which is funny but then as I was rewatching and Stephanie Lemon's doing the Russian that the subtitle on the bottom, it says, welcome to area 52 or whatever. And I was like, Oh, well there it is. I just, I just went around a giant circle and I could have just looked right there. It was very obvious, but the, I just, I think it's really funny. The area 52 thing, but we get Dimitri who was the rocket red from the justice league. Again, we talked about this a little bit in the scream something. So the Justice League, b before they went to full Justice League International, they just stopped being the Justice League of America, the JLA, and they just became the Justice League. Pretty sure that's when he joined. He was number four, you know, Rocket Red number four. They didn't really talk about the one, two, and three, I don't think. So in the comics, 
there's no there's four and there's seven. I think those are the only two that I know of that are mentioned at least from my research mentioned specifically. And Dimitri, they have him described on on the wiki. It says or the DC wiki, I think it says not the DC wiki, but the Wikipedia has him listed and says a kind-hearted and jolly man with a taste for American culture, which I thought was really funny because he's the one who recognizes Tork, which I thought was a little funny nod. Not sure if I would uh, describe him as jolly, uh, but he definitely... You know, we saw him at a very bad moment. We did. We saw him at a very intense moment. He did. He was implying like he's doing this for you know, not for like glory or power. Like he was doing it for, you know, f- for reasons that he felt were good, like honor and that kind of thing. I can't remember the phrase that he used, but it just gave this implication that he was doing, trying to do it for a good reason, which would be fascinating. And the fact that it's supposed to be like, they're like, we'll show that justice league basically, you know? And I'm like, yeah, until you join, <laughs> and then you'll, you'll show them while you're there <laughs> working with them. Um, the follow up after Dimitri dies, actually, there's another Rocket Red, Gavril uh, Ivanovich. And though, of course, it's not exactly the same, I was wondering if like there's some inspiration for the name Olga Ilyich for who she is, because I, I don't know her. She's new to the comics. And Stephanie Lemlin and Steve Bloom. I don't speak Russian. Russian looks hard. That sounded really good to me. So if any of our listeners speak Russian, if you can actually tell us how well they did, <laughs> shoot us a message on Twitter and the email and, and let us know if their accents or, or whatnot were completely off. If I'm remembering correctly, like I just I just remember this. I think at Comic-Con two years ago, like right before season three came out, when we had like no details and no one was allowed oh, right. to talk about anything, Stephanie Lemlin just kind of offhandedly mentioned and something. She's like, yeah, I had to I had to talk to one of my neighbors to really get how I was supposed to pronounce this other language that I had to do for the show. Oh, I like, do remember that. Can you tell yeah. us what language? She's like, no, I can't. I can't tell you anything. I probably shouldn't even have said that. Uh, <laughs> and like for the whole series, you do, we don't see like Artemis to do anything so i'm assuming it was probably this i'm guessing this would be it because it's it's not a small scene either it's a lot of russia gotta connect all of the cryptic san diego comic-con interviews to stuff that eventually happens you just got to make all those connections right slowly over the course of the season and what i think is funny is uh i mean they do a really good job solid job of giving us some some bits of a language that's alien and then finding a way to translate it, right? Yeah. So, like, the father or mother box is translating languages or Calder or Laura Lemuris in that one episode casting translation magic and things like that. So, we could, so the actors can just speak English, <laughs> which, is, which is very helpful. This scene is chock full of Russian. <laughs> they did not have a way to do that or they didn't, they didn't put a way to do that. Uh, and I think that was cool, actually. Yeah. So they probably could have done something. Like, they obviously have to hear each other through some kind of ear mics or something going on when McGann's not there. Like, perhaps they could have done an auto translation, but I like... They show that the contacts that they have right. uh, translate it to subtitles for them. They do <laughs> auto English subtitles. They do auto English subtitles, which is very helpful. But I was saying, like, for the for the sake of the actors, they probably yeah. could have also done an audio translation into English as well. But they didn't choose to do that. And I think the sure, actors did a cool. really, really good job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I love the return of the Arctic camouflage suits. Yes. I do have to wonder, I guess Artemis was the first one to get snuffed in that episode. So um, she doesn't really remember much of it, but... And none of the original team was actually on that mission. But I can't, I, I can't help but think that every time somebody has to put on one of those suits, somebody from the original team's having a flashback. They wore them. They also wore them in cold hearted. Like they've worn them times where everything didn't go horribly, horribly wrong. I guess that's true. <laughs> that's true. Let's see. There's a few things. Oh, you may be able to answer this question. Did Bioship have weapons before this season? Because I, I don't remember Bioship having, and, and all I can think of is, and this is probably just my headcanon, but in Failsafe, they take one of those alien weapons off of the, the, the ship and they, they attach it to Bioship. Yeah. 
And I'm thinking like, okay, did Bioship not have weapons at all? Or did they choose to use the alien's weapon against them because it was more effective? But now I can't, I played through both seasons in my head, uh, the first two seasons, and I don't remember any scenes where Bioship had weapons. If anybody remembers an episode that, that Bioship was shooting at something in the first two seasons, let me know. Because that's interesting because Bioship does a lot of firing in this season. Quick Google later. And according to YJ Wiki, Bioship's page on the YJ Wiki okay. says, though uh, it originally did not have any offensive capabilities, a later modification included a ray gun in the nose. So there you go. Apparently... I like it did not like occur to me, but yeah. So the implication is that the first the first two seasons Bioship did not have weapons and now Bioship does have weapons. Yes. But we don't know what the story is specifically about. She's that. evolving. Interesting. Like and she that's, can be see, an RV that, now. But see, that's what I'm thinking too, is that just like uh Sphere, the Bioship can grow and evolve and like obviously shape change, right? But into more complex or things that as as she gets more familiar with earth technology being able to turn into you know a wide range of things including a limousine like you know or a, whatever that was the suv and the rv like i find that interesting but then this thing of like a modification was added to have a weapon in the nose and i'm like is that how that works or did bioship evolve itself does it have to have mechanical additions or can she grow like wetware but i have all kinds of questions about about bioship and how bioship like like if somebody like in that limousine scene where they're driving around in bioship in a limousine somebody lifts the hood is there an engine in there or is it just an externalization of in fact emily's just staring at me right now i'm fascinated by shape-shifting and how shape-shifting works in comics and other things so it's all good. Uh, I, just, I have no answers. I, I yeah. wish I did. I don't know why I didn't notice it in the first half of the first of, of this season because, you know, there's the West maneuver and like there's other stuff that happens that I don't think about. Because no one treats it as strange within the show. So we don't. That's part of the thing with the time skips. Sometimes things happen and our brains just go, I guess this is the way it's always been. And then you pause and you're like, no, no, that's new. Yeah. But everyone is used to it. So it's not that new. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. Okay, so the YJ Wiki, thanks YJ Wiki, as always, says that it also implies that there were no weapons in the first two seasons. Okay, interesting. Uh, speaking of the YJ Wiki too, uh, there is a mention of Warden Economos uh, in the scene with Waller and Aquaman. And yes. I was, I didn't recognize who that was. Like, <laughs> for some reason, I didn't look up the director, but I looked this up. Uh, <laughs> and so I went on and, and YJ Wiki had the answer that John Economos, who was the warden of Bell Rev during the John Ostrander run on Suicide Squad. So there's a, it's a Suicide Squad run comic uh, nod uh, to that warden. So that's pretty cool. Conservation of DC characters. I know, right? Exactly. If you're going to mention it, mention something. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then uh, Neil, let's see what Neil's got. <laughs> He's like, okay, yeah, this happened. November 16th, a 1616 Space Trek 3016 episode, three, scene 316, take 16, uh, scene 16, take 16, all of its magical, ending up with 52 takes. But this is what he says. Every timestamp, every, all the timestamps double through the episode. Why is this happening? Question mark, exclamation point. Timestamp 1616, 1717, 21, 21, 2020, 23, 23, 10, 10, 11, 11, 12, 12, 16, 16. So it starts and ends with 1616. I think it's just one of those things that got put in there to see if anybody would notice. You, I don't know. That, I, mm. what, what do you think there's time shenanigans? Like, what do you think is happening? I think it's just I, I don't know. Egg. But the fact, like, at first I was like, oh, it's a bunch of random ones. That's funny. But. Then it starts and ends with 16, very specifically. And it makes me wonder if... I, so, 10 hat time. I'm like, is there a code Rich. in there? Is it a code? Rich. What? I'm not doing more math for this. So, here's... I wonder if it's letters. I don't know. Now, I'm going to go go back and oh, go no. through there. Could be letters of the alphabet. You never know. Surprised we haven't ever looked up what the 16th letter of the alphabet is. <laughs> <laughs> for Young Justice in the entirety of our show. I don't think that's ever happened. 
<laughs> if somebody knows it what's can, going on with that, let us letters. know. I don't think it can be letters. Okay. I don't think that because I was going through. I just start. I just started. I started doing some counting in my head with the alphabet, uh, which means ten, eleven, twelve would be J K L, which isn't anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. Unless it's like uh, like uh, an an anagram or whatever. Oh, uh, uh, then you can unless rearrange it's like the all the letter letters are jumbled around. <laughs> but Rich, I think we really are falling down a rabbit hole here that is going to get us nowhere. <laughs> I'll put my tin hat away. I'll put it away. Uh, Neil also says, uh, uh, oh, Stephanie is the voice of Olga is awesome. Rocket Red Brigade has been the DC universe for some time. Dimitri Pushkin being one of his longtime members. I was reading something too about uh, his dad, Dimitri Pushkin's dad, having been one of the originators of the Rocket Red uh, suits. Like he was one of the original developers at some point in time in the history. With the Rocket Red Brigade, I personally think it's very interesting that we are introduced to one and four, and we see no mention or hint of who two and three are. Right. Or how Which, many. Or how many. I think because because he's labeled as four and Must is only just one. getting his powers yeah. now, it implies to me that maybe there aren't more yet. Yeah. Or that they there aren't people who have at least bonded with the mechs yet. There might be people in training. And but it's like, early just, on and early on enough that Waller and the team only just found out about this place. Yeah. So I'm just like, who are two and three? I have questions. <laughs> Let's see. He also says, the team successfully completed a covert mission for a, a little bit. He's still blown away by the fact that Waller didn't know about the team. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a thing. Uh, I want that tie-in comic too. <laughs> he says something that will probably be more crashing the mode. Uh, and of course, the photo of Garfield is now up to 52 million likes. So... Yeah, a lot of numbers in this one. Indeed. Again. Let's head into the mid-roll, uh, and then uh, we'll come back for a Canary Debrief, some fan service, and crash in the mode. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. We have a new five-star review. Thank you so much to listener Creative Gog. Uh, their review is wonderful and very detailed, so please forgive uh, this bit of an edit. <laughs> Words cannot accurately describe how incredible this podcast is, but I'll try my best. First and foremost, this entire podcast, put simply, is a complete and utter candy land for anyone, A, who loves Young Justice, B, who loves DC, C, who loves good writing, D, who loves having a good laugh, E, who wants to create and write themselves, and anyone who kind of loves in general. I came here to scratch my Young Justice itch after catching up on the recent released first part of Season 3 about a month back. I expected to find simple recaps of the episodes, some discussion, and general DC-wide spoilers. Of course it was that, but my goodness, it was so much more. Uh, that they, they go on to break down the, our show in detail for new listeners, which is amazing in a review. Thank you for that. Uh, but then they finish up. My thanks to the epic team behind this knows no bounds, and what makes it so truly great is they are all so utterly passionate about it and the source material. It's frankly a pleasure to listen to. The amount of happiness this podcast has brought me is nothing short of complete and absolute, and have made many, many, many of my days enjoyable and interesting. So thanks so much, guys. Really, your podcast is truly incredible. Thank you so much, Creative Gog. We really appreciate that. We'd also like to welcome our newest Patreon member, Ian Bankins. Ian is a longtime dear friend of mine whom I haven't seen in far too long. Thank you, Ian. I miss you, my friend. If you haven't noticed already, you'll also see that the team is up on two episodes of the DC Daily Show. We recap the first half of this first half of this second half of season three, and then we recap the second half of the second half of season three as well with Amy Dolan and Hector Navarro. So you can go check those out. It was September 23rd was the most recent episode. Uh, and you can see us there uh, on site with them. But before we wrap for today, we want to send congratulations to Young Justice tie-in comics artist Christopher Jones, who has announced that he has been hired onto season four as a storyboard revisionist and is moving to LA. We are so happy to hear it, Christopher, and congrats. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. For this week's debrief, we're revisiting role-playing game scenarios, but as is often the case, you'll see parallels to writing here as well. This is a classic infiltration and information gathering session. You set up a goal, 
The players organize their plan. The plan goes really well, even to the point of not really needing to roll any dice. The only place here that I may have had someone roll is when Halo camouflages the team. But other than that, they've all used their powers in solid, non-conflict ways, and I would probably skip that roll and give them the win. Because the point in this session isn't, do they get the information? If I want them to know what the Plushad 52 base is, then they're going to get the information. There's no reason to keep it from them because they miss a roll. Whether or not they get the information isn't the most important aspect of the scenario. It's what they end up doing with it. So now they have it. The players think, that was easy. Excellent. Gives them an up. Gives them a win. Then it's time to throw in a complication. The choices of villains here is actually interesting. Black Manta is almost a given if I want to do like a Suicide Squad thing based on Young Justice, since Artemis is in the scene and this could lead to some interesting interactions. No offense to Boomerang, but making sure there's a non-powered villain, albeit with, you know, quite a bit of experience, is a good choice for a new team figuring out their powers and their dynamics. Uh, of course, if I'm going to set up a reveal like the one with Halo, also having at least one of these villains be a mercenary like Boomerang helps as it's easy to see him using a phrase, a trigger phrase like, I have a deal for you. Malo rounds out the group a bit by adding both muscle and firepower, and that seems to be... <laughs> his role in a lot of these episodes he's he's in but honestly with the level of intellect that he has in the comics i'd find some way for him to communicate with his team and perhaps even be leading the team but that's a personal preference for me though my game master instinct tells me i'd want one more antagonist here though uh maybe either icicle jr or killer frost as a foil to geoforce's hot lava uh both can be interesting choices, as Junior also has a history with Artemis Tigris, uh, and Frost can balance out the kind of testosterone-heavy villain group, um, and also Frost is pretty powerful. <laughs> By putting in a Suicide Squad encounter here, the team has to make a decision, which is really the focus of this game session around the table. Do they choose to defend this base, a Russian asset that Brion and likely Terra are definitely upset about? Or do they let the antagonists here go at each other? Either choice leads to some interesting narrative outcomes. If they don't intervene, what political consequences come up down the line? How do they find out about ta Task Force X? Uh, if they do intervene, how do they talk themselves out of an international incident like happened in the episode? But also, how do Brion and Terra react? Do they push back after the encounter with the team? Or do they find a, some kind of learning or growth experience from it that, you know, they're a, an international team that needs to act like an international team. So this can apply to writing as well. Action is satisfying to lots of readers and watchers, but I encourage you to add those personal layers even to a scenario that has a lot of combat in it. Move the narrative forward. Stir up your players, your characters' emotions. Bring up interesting background information like the relationship between Markovia and Russia that helps develop the world and bring up questions and, and lay down loose strings to pull on later in your novel, comic, or uh, your campaign. Let's hand it over to Emily for uh, some fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative endeavors we think Young Justice fans will love. If there is a fan creator that you love who's making family-friendly art, music, videos, AMVs, comics, cosplay, or anything else related to Young Justice or DC Comics, please send us a link at the YJ Files on Twitter or at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. For this week's fan service, we are featuring an artist known as Beside Seaside. They've got some funny stuff, some shipping stuff, some bat family stuff, and it's all in a really adorable art style. So we'll have a link to their Tumblr down in the show notes, and you should definitely go check them out. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. If you're spoiler wary, this is your warning. Hairbrush. Hairbrush. We yeah. can start with hairbrush. Hi. Hairbrush is evil. 
Dr. Jace evil. is evil. Evil. Uh, Awful. She's doing evil science with an evil hairbrush. And somebody, she's evil. Some, somebody hurt Jace <laughs> in a bad way. Ooh. Yeah, it's not good. I, I, I thought it was cool that the that the lab was in Dakota City, though. So now we get confirmation. I don't know. Did we see Dakota? Oh, we may have seen Dakota City mentioned in earlier episodes, actually, when like things yeah. were happening worldwide. Dakota City gets mentioned. Uh, maybe so. when Rocket's saving like a bus or something from the plant episode, Revelation. I think there's some some scenes like that that have Dakota City. But it was nice to see Sorry, wait. Dakota City. Repeat, repeat that last sentence. I did not follow that <clears throat> sentence at all. There's the episode where Joker's controlling the plants. Yes. Revelation. I'm yes. pretty sure that's the first time we see Rocket. Yes. And maybe Guy Gardner. No, and we I'm see pretty- Rocket in... Rocket's see- in the... the- in failsafe or in uh the world without parents episode or something rocket is somewhere doing something one of those before we like meet her and know she's rocket there's an episode where there's a school bus going off of a bridge because that's a thing that happens in the dc universe all the time they really need to find better way to transport children um but she (laughs) creates one of her one of her um bubbles and holds up the bus i thought that was in i thought that was in uh, revelation but it might be in a different maybe it isn't Maybe it I isn't think fail it's safe. Fail safe. I think you're right. I think it's it, I like think new right. heroes will take up the call, and we show Rocket doing that. But yes, we then have heard of Dakota City before. All right, there you go. That's the. Basic I think. Sta- I think static is static from Dakota City. Right. Am I thinking of the right one? Yeah. Well, so then we should be. Yeah, I don't know. Now I want to go back and watch the whole show again, uh, <laughs> and find out where Dakota City's mentioned. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention we were talking about earlier is this technology. That Garfield uses. So you talked about how there's the Martian, like Martians don't care when they shapeshift to be able to speak because they're telepathic. So it doesn't matter to them. So where did Garfield's technology come from? And later on, we see Ultra Humanite has one of these translator boxes. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. And that's what was making me think because Ultra Humanite's body in Young Justice is from, and it might be in the regular comics too. I don't want to have to go back and listen to my 16... Secret Origins of Gorillas episode, but I may. That body comes from, you know, the it was one of the uplifted gorillas that they had in the tie-in comics. And I think you're right. I think McGann was translating for them with the telepathy. I could have sworn yes. there was something else happening with these vocal boxes. But here's the thing that I find really funny. No one gives one to Mala. Mala's got like 187 IQ. A poor, a poor dude. Poor and dude. and Ultra Humanite gets one of these, but you can't give one to Mala. Maybe he doesn't want one. That's fair. I mean, that's fair. Also, maybe maybe Waller just didn't think to do it. Why wouldn't you? I don't know. I don't know. And maybe wanna, maybe Mala's like, I'm not putting a this. collar around my neck. I don't care what it does. <laughs> that's that's a possibility, yes. right? That one, right? Or or maybe Mala's like, I don't need to be fixed. Leave me alone, right? That's also a possibility too, but yeah, still, absolutely, yeah. But still, that's I, I find the whole thing fascinating. So, where is Garfield's that that technology is not a one shot for just Garfield, and it had to have come from somewhere. Who made that, and why? And the fact that there's the tie into Ultra Humanite using it, and possibly the Gorillas of Young Justice's Gorilla City, which has been a few years now. So, I wonder what that place looks like. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. Yeah. I don't have an answer. Anyway. I do have a couple of random little crash in the mode things, though. Yeah. So, uh, upon many, many rewatches, we start putting all of the pieces together. We have that moment where Calder is checking in on the whole team and he's like, oh, yeah. How'd everyone do? And Artemis How'd- says, You know, they can hear you. And he says, I do. And then follows it up with, and-, and Tara. And she says, She did fine. And we just kind of accepted this. I think in our scream, something we were like, this we mentioned feels something suspicious. like that's why uh, would you do that? Yeah, but it is absolutely on going back and rewatching, knowing everything we know. Artemis and Calder kind of subtly checking in with each other and keeping an eye on Tara, but also showing that they trust and respect her very openly to be like, see, people can trust and respect you. Yeah, you don't have to betray everyone. Yes. Don't kill people. Teaching by example. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's true. 
you mentioned this and Neil mentioned this. The all we have we all have secrets to keep. Yes, from <laughs> Neil Calder. mentioned it in his notes earlier, and I was like, we'll talk that in Crash in the Mode because I think Emily's going to mention that as well. Yeah, because you know we're bo- we're both thinking it. Calder's just like Calder has the whole anti light thing going on, and it's just like, <sighs> yes, yes, you do all have secrets to keep, very big secrets that maybe you shouldn't have. It's fine. This can't possibly go wrong. No, not at all. We also, as we were saying, you got Jace being real heckin' sketchy about the whole hairbrush thing, because uh, find all that out later. She's not her child, my gosh. Ooh. I just, uh, <laughs> we will never be able to unpack An all that. An abomination who's um, dating my son. Oh, there's so much wrong with that sentence. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. Just, just, I'm just going to shrink in on myself in response. Uh, we get more set up. For Will and Artemis mutually rejecting each other. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because, you know, these scenes the first time through being like, are we are we going here? And then the show goes there and immediately has both of them go, nope, no, that nope, was a mistake. Nope, nope. nope. <laughs> Never yeah. again. This is and, a big reveal course, about Gabriel. Halo. Too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we get the whole big reveal about uh, Gabrielle's backstory that we'd all been theorizing and piecing together for a whole season and then finding out, oh, Oh, it's exactly as bad as it could be. <laughs> uh, and we'll see all that unfold as she goes to Jace for help when that's the worst person you could go to. They could never know. I'm like, yeah, that lasts like an episode. I don't know. Two episodes. I don't know how long. It well, lasts she that. I think she specifically means Brion and Tara, who hilariously Tara is sitting right in front of her as Halo makes this very ominous statement to no one, and Tara's just kind of on the couch, just like. Oh, I didn't notice that. That's funny. Whatever. At least she was. Maybe she would. Maybe she also got up to go with Brion to go help Will. Like that would probably make more sense. But like the one of the couple of times through, like my brain was like, is Tara just sitting there on her phone while Halo makes ominous declarations to the middle distance? They can never know. Tara's like, what? Ah, excellent. You could never know? Something else. You could never know what? Let me record this. Right. Uh, and finally, a thought. A thought that I had like right before we started. I'm throwing okay. the notes. All right. Because uh, I was rewatching that bit where Brion goes off about how they got to stop the Rocket Red Brigade because it's going to be propaganda and the Russian Justice League and all of this. Oh, yeah. And they're going to use them as weapons and blah. Yeah. Yes. Gotcha. And I think on some level, Brion's very aggressive response to all that could be viewed as a little bit of an indication and setup for his his turn at the end of this uh, season because the, his sense of of nationalism and pride in his country and protecting his country and those feelings that he has about all of that and then having that uh exploited and controlled by the ambassador kind of just pushing him just over that edge from I from I have these feelings because of my country and wanting to be a good king uh-huh. to oh I can do whatever I want to prevent this. Uh adding a layer to that. Yes, go for it. I just remembered, I think this is true. Bazovi in yes. the comics was a KGB agent. <sighs> yep. So if he's a if he's a, oh, I just got chills. If he's a Russian spy with this mental ability and he's worked his way in as a sleeper agent into Markovia, yeah, he's called the Bad Samaritan. Yep, KGB. <sighs> Bad Samaritan is a fictional character published DC Comics, Mike Barr and Jim Aparo. Definitely a KGB agent. Interesting. At least in traditional comics. <laughs> yeah. I did not make that connection until now. That's what the show is for. <laughs> yes, that's it is. what we do. It's for us to talk through our therapy. Any other bombs, Emily? <laughs> no, I think that's it. <laughs> awesome. All right, with that, I think we can zade out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJ Files.tumblr.com, on our website, Crashing the Mode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. 
If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you're able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 